The Big Footy Port LA podcast is proudly sponsored by New Vision. My team, Kanda, power. I love the power. power, power. I love the power. power. Hi everyone, Mecca19 here from the Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast, joined by Fishing Rick. How are you, buddy? Yeah, good thanks, Mecca. What about you? Yeah, always good, buddy. And, Great. Uh, we've got a bit of a special guest this evening, someone with uh, one of the most important roles at the footy club. We're speaking with the strength coach and performance nutritionist, Andrew Rondinelli. Hey, good day, guys. How are you? Very good, mate. Thanks for coming on. No, no worries at all. Look, as we do with all the guests, uh, can you give us a bit of a rundown about how you ended up uh, working at Port Adelaide? Yeah, no worries. I'm uh, originally from Melbourne. I um, studied a hum- human movement degree down there for three or four years. Um, while I was studying that, I worked at the with the Vic Metro under-18 side, so sort of doing some GPS analysis. Then um, through that, I ended up getting like a, a little part-time role with the Northern Bullands, who back then, or well, now they call the Northern Blues, but back then they were the Cullen Reserve side. Yep. Um, and then from there, I actually started doing a bit of work with the the Calderon AFL side and um, pretty much from there once uni was all done um, pretty much had an interview um, for a sports science rehab role at St Kilda and also at the same pretty much two days after that had one at Port Adelaide and um, yeah ended up getting the uh, Port Adelaide job and made the move up to Adelaide and I've been stuck here ever since so um, yeah fingers crossed we, we, we get a bit of success uh, over the next uh, year or so. Fantastic. So how many years have you been at the club now? Uh, I'm entering my sixth season, so five oh, wow. full years, yeah. Oh, good stuff. Awesome. Yeah. So, so what's your actual... A... Sorry, Andrew, I was going to say, what's your actual role entail? Because you've got a, a couple of roles, yeah. don't you? Yeah, yeah. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. So I'm uh, over... You know, primary, I oversee the nutrition program and manage it. So um, that's from supplements to dietary to game day performance nutrition. Um, that might take up, let's say... 20 or 30 percent of my time the rest of my time i'm i manage the second year players in the gym so there's about nine or ten players in that group um so i manage them um also help out with some of the conditioning warm-ups um reco- recovery processes so it's sort of like a, a little bit of a mixed bag bag role which is good because um in the future if I ever wanted to step into a role you know like darren's um it's probably good to have you know an understanding of each different area so yeah excellent so why um why is it is it just because it's easier for you to manage and the other coaches that you're just allocated one sort of year year level or entry level of the players compared to having players from beginning to 10 years into the system yeah yeah so like with our club but you probably find across the afl um, whether you go three, four, five years back, there's, there was generally the one person who looked after 45 players in the gym. And what tends to happen is um, when players are either integrated into the main group from a rehab process or whether they're, they're traded to the club or a draftee, you find that th- those players need a lot of, or a lot more attention than, let's say, the guys who have been there 10 or 12 years. Um, so we've found that and, and the AFL stats have shown that the one to two first and second year players, they're most prone to soft tissue injuries. So um, over the last couple of years, we've there's three of us in the gym. So there's Ian McEwen, who, who's head of athletic development. So he oversees the whole program, but um, he works really closely with the rehab coach, whose name, his name's Tim Parham. and he's first year at the club. He was originally at GWS. Okay. Um, so he works really close with him and sort of, really fine lines that that gap between physiotherapy and strength and conditioning um and he 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 looks after the four four plus years um myself i've got it's classified as second year development group but um it's pretty much all our second year players plus we've put jared polek and jake need in that group as well so it's it's the the group that's the that's probably not up to the level to step up yet so um and then we've got greg king who um, he's from. He's moved down from Sydney. He originally was the uh, Magpies fitness coach. Now he's come on to the AFL side part time. He looks after the first year players. So our new draftees are th- um, four or five of them. Plus, um, he also helps out with some of the rehab, the rehab process, and a lot of the off feet conditioning. So when guys can't run, he takes care of them in. in we call it the sweat box with a lot of their off feet sessions or in the pool, and he he helps coordinate that. So we've um, got a good little team, both you know, 
just in the gym, but in the whole sports science area as well. Yeah, I was just going to say, for me, it's a bit of a cliche, but for me, the playing group look uh, kind of leaner but meaner this year. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, so we've we've sort of... Um, well, from from when Ken Ken came over, the one thing, the whole the whole group um, based on our based on what the coaches were after was a running game plan. So, you know, four or five years ago, there was that Geelong model where a lot of teams wanted to focus on being big and and big. It was a lot of contested footy, so you needed those big bodies. And yep. Geelong, when they won those flags, that was the that was the benchmark. So a lot of the teams under them obviously wanted to get to that. Whereas now, if you have a look at um, if you have a look at the Hawthorne and the Sydney's and the way they face their football, um, it, it is a running game, and to have guys who are whether whether they're you know carrying extra weight, um, it, it just to me it just doesn't make sense. So we've one focused on obviously a bit, the running output of these guys, but two making sure that they've got enough um, like their their whole lean mass throughout their body is sufficient to support the training demands. So it's been a process, um, but yeah, we're sort of. I think now we're in a really good good position with you know the group at whole. Obviously, the younger kids there, they're a couple of steps back, but those key, you know, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, or you know, in, in your, for starting eighteen, are yeah, really, really, really in a good position. So how would you um, how do you taper the players from the beginning to the maturity of their body in a weight session? Because I know. There's a, I think there's a bit of a myth with some port supporters. Obviously, we don't see what's going mm. on, but Macca, you probably read the boards more than I do. But I think some people think we don't really do much in, in weight work or gym work. And, um, well, that's what I get from some people. But I don't think that's the case. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm believing you just do it. Maybe you do lighter, lighter weights, higher reps or something. And No, absolutely not. We're, we're pushing these guys quite hard now. And a lot of them, we're not, like those players who have been in the club, eight or nine years so you know you, your bob your bobbies your bokies the guy they're actually a lot stronger now than what they have been um and that's just one maturity but two we do we, we, yeah that is a bit of if we do we they do lift quite heavy in the gym it's um i like to use the example if you go to the circus or look at gymnasts they're quite lean but they're i guarantee you they're a lot stronger than or they mm-hmm. you know in, they can do a lot of movements a lot better than a lot of AFL players and, you know, therefore a lot of rugby players, a lot of rugby union players. So, no, it's an absolute myth. We we measure these guys, um, you know, we, we probably run between seven, eight or nine different type of strength tests regularly, whether that be a power assessment, a speed assessment or a general strength one. And, no, the, the boys are they're really strong. And the other thing is, um, you know, we continue to push them in season, like this whole maintenance, maintenance uh, word. Um, it doesn't sort of sit well with Ian... And um, myself and Greg, so we, yeah, throughout the whole year, we, we keep pushing them. And that's, you know, you can think both in the gym, but the stuff Burjo's or the level Burjo's got them to on the track, um, you know, pre-season, they're pretty much playing three games during a, during a week, you know. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just one of those, yeah, it is a big myth. I did actually did hear on the radio a couple of weeks, so you have a little bit of a chuckle, but, um, yeah, size isn't everything. You can have some really, really big guys such as bodybuilders who, you know, you know, Chad Wingard can probably lift more than them. So, it's, yeah, it is a big myth. <laughs> I always remember the rule of thumb in life is it's not the big guys you've got to watch out for. It's the wiry guys that end up being the strongest ones sometimes. Yeah, exactly right, exactly right. And, and the other thing, obviously, is a big injury prevention and making the players robust. So being able to mm. with, withhold the whole season, and um, that, that's a big, big area of focus as well. But, yeah. So do you think keeping, keeping them leaner... Um, assists in uh, in their running ability and therefore injury prevention is that what you're saying um, oh, it's, it's a little bit but obviously they've got to have quite a quite a large amount of muscle mass on their body um, so to, to get that you sort of sacrifice or you know a lot of that fast fat mass so we've done um, we do dexa scans as well as um, skin fold measurements just to make sure we're on top of on top of that but um, yeah, it, it is. There is obviously there is a lot of players who are quite big and can run really well. But the general rule of thumb is, if you just look at the Olympics and you can see a hundred meter sprinter compared to um, a lot of the team sport athletes or you know endurance athletes, you can see the different body compositions. Whereas AFL, you sort of got to sit in, in, in the middle. Mm. Um, so someone like you know Schultz or Bobby, who you really need to be powerful and strong. 
their, their program, both dietary and and strength base, is going to be different to a um, Angus Monfries or a Chad Wingard, who are, you know you sneaky half forwards. Yep. Who are the young guys that you look after have been the real star in the gym this preseason and look uh, you know set to step up to AFL level body wise? Yeah, I reckon um, he's not so young, but in in for our at our club he's only been there a short amount of time. But I think Jared Polek, he's um. He obviously came to the club having a lot of injuries and quite quite frustrated with his previous years. And you know, he he admits to everyone that if he probably didn't get a chance at at Port Adelaide or another club, he probably wouldn't be playing AFL. And um, he he's started to understand what it takes to get to that level. And you know, playing in our midfield, he's got to get up there with Bo Kamish, Ollie, um, Robbie Gray now, Kane, and he's he, and to do that, he's he's under you know the, the work he is required to do both in the gym and on the track. Um, he's, he has come around to that and he's been outstanding both from uh, a running performance point of view so his time trial and some other measurements we do to a, to a, in, a, in the gym as well um, so he's one the other one will probably be Jake Need yeah. um, from where he's come from in a remote area he's the way he's moving in the gym now is just yeah it's, it's outstanding and um, he's someone else that you know, you know I, I ride quite a bit but he's um, yeah he's come along really well so both of them I think if I had to if I have to put uh, money on to hopefully have a, a pretty decent year, it'll be them too, I think, from my group anyway. Fantastic. I've got a different type of question for you, Andrew, and I'm going to use Hamish Hartlett as an example where you don't have to necessarily talk about him exactly, but um, he obviously tweaked some some muscle um, in that West Coast game and obviously precautionary was uh, taken out of the other trial games. Um, what sort of effect uh, or is there any effect um, with Hamish travelling to Perth on the plane, which is a long flight, and back uh, with his injury recovery, is a higher risk playing him potentially in this Frio game compared to sitting him out. No, no, absolutely not. The the flight, you know, it's, it's only a three hour flight. If we were going um, overseas, where it's you know it might be a ten or twelve or thirteen hour flight, like some soccer clubs do, um, oh, you know, you probably would question it. But he's done the amount of work he's done to play, like is you know. It, like we measure him through GPS, through heart rate, it's like he's ready to go. All the players we select, they're hundred percent, you know, no issues at all. Um, so you know, over the over the the boys had a couple of um, days off, and he was you know, him, Chad Winger. They've they've all done sessions um, to get right for this game. So um, yeah, the, the the flight the flight wouldn't would be no impact at all. Right, great. So you're also in charge of diet and. As we were saying before we started, I think there's a it's a great conversation to talk about the elite athlete, but also the the average punter like like us out there that uh, are sort of reading things. So, how how much discipline do the players uh, need to have with their diet regime? I mean, they're pretty lean. Uh, we just when you talk about the body fat reduction, um, so what do you what do you make them stick to? Yeah, so. The- like um, looking at the whole list, there's probably only th- I reckon four or five players that were at the club before I started. So I've actually had a lot of these players have come through while I've been at the club, which is an easy job for me because as they come through, you can educate them, and then it makes the process easier. Where if, if I was to go into a club that is already established, um, it's a lot harder to bring your methods in. So um, basically, now this year, apart from you know the, maybe first and second years, the main the main points we want to, you know, um, moving away from just the basics of diet is the performance nutrition. So making sure that w- what they're doing game day is going to really enhance their output on the field. Um, so that, that's been a you know, big focus of mine. I think the actual, um, of course, I keep feeding them information about the types of foods they should be having and, and you know, in conjunction with um, their, their training program. But um, the the main focus now is with this group, and is is you know you can do a little bit less than that, a bit more of the cool stuff. So some of the performance nutrition, um, yeah, which is you know obviously a lot, of, a lot of that's kept in house what we do game day, but um, mm. it, it's it is it, you know it can give you an edge, and um, yeah, the players buy into it, which is good. Great. Is it is it difficult to keep them on the straight and narrow? Is it a pretty restrictive um, diet that they have to adhere to, or is there a little bit nah. of liberal? No, no, the boys are the boys are really good. Like we've, um, if you just look, like just you know, based off our leadership group, they they don't really let the rest of the players get away with too much. Um, like I'm not too, I'm I'm not a Nazi, so I'm not too fussed after a game if the boys want to go have a treat or whatever else. But um, 
yeah, they are. They, they, they do understand there's that many measurements we do, so they can't really get away with too much. Mm. Um, so, yeah, obviously the off-season, they've got to let their hair down a bit and have a bit of fun but or over Christmas. But generally when they're, when they're there to train and they've got games coming up, um, you don't really want to compromise their recovery as well as their recovery from um, you know, training and games, yeah. Sure. I guess what's the process on match days in terms of um, how closely do you look after the players' fluid intake um, and that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, so it's probably... Like, I, I think hi- hydration can be a little bit overrated. Um, like, the most I've ever... Like, we, we, we make sure the players, as soon as they get to the ground, for example, they weigh themselves... Straight after the game, they weigh out. It's a really, really basic measure. And like local clubs can do it to just get indication of how much fluid you're actually losing during exercise. Yeah. So, um, so we 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 do that, and from there I can have a look and say, okay. And generally, this is done through the NAB Cup. You can say, oh, this player he's losing three kilos a game. But you know, then I can address him and say, let's have a look at what 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 are you having in the game that you know currently, and then I, from there I can say, do you need extra carbohydrate? Do you need extra fluid? Um, are you cramping? You can sort of start asking these questions. At the moment, um, we look at, you know, you base yourself on that 2% figure. Um, like the whole last year, there was, no, there was no maybe one player that probably lost over 2%. So from a hydration point of view, I, I did not have to worry about that the whole year. Yep. Um, our trainers, they've been really good. They make sure they get out there at whenever they can. I'm on the bench ensuring when the boys come off there is any issues, I can address it. Um, but yeah, the, oh, the players are on top. It's, it, it is. I think it can be an area which, as I said before, is is a little bit overrated. Um, because from a fatigue point of view, um, you don't have to be super, super, super hydrated to enhance that. Yep. So, well, can you have too much fluid? Before yeah, exactly. that? that's the other thing. You can have too much, and that's when you start feeling bloated and and a little bit heavy and a little bit sluggish. Um, mm. We we measure hydration. Um, as well before the game with a refractometer so we can so basically the, the players give me a urine sample and uh, we measure that pretty much the same time as they weigh in mm. and then from there uh, we can sort of get an indication of where they sit um, same same thing as the body weight you know in the past two years I, you know, I've never seen a player rock up to an AFL game dehydrated it's more when I do use that I might say well you, you're on the edge of getting probably being a little bit over hydrated let's for the rest for the rest of your warm up Let's just back off the fluid, and I think you're ready to go. Um, and obviously, through that, that that's all also done, you know, occasionally in week, just to keep them on on their toes as well during the week. So, how if we take it to the layman person? Yeah. Um, if I gave you three topical uh, items in the media which are being portrayed as bad, how what would you how would you place them in order? If I gave you alcohol carbohydrates or sugar um how should the average punter how should we be treating those um those items so do you want me to rank them in so in, one one being what, uh the worst worst for you yeah yeah probably go um alcohol sugar carbohydrate with alcohol being the worst yeah i think and, yeah yeah. Like from yeah, as in if we're talking about the average punter who exercises, um, yeah, alcohol is probably you know one it one it can it's for them it's not the greatest for your recovery. And there's a lot of research to support that, um, mm. and also and obviously the excess calories um, when you consume it, um, sugar, sugar. A lot of people think is the enemy and it's the worst thing in the world for you. It's it's not going to kill you. You can have a little bit of sugar. But at the same time, I think mainly for younger children, there's a lot of hidden sugar in a lot of the products. So, um, you know, I don't have a child yet, but I know if I, when I do or if I do, um, that's one thing that you, you'll just monitor very closely when you're buying products. Um, mm. Carbohydrate, same thing. Um, it's something which is portrayed as the enemy. And if you have carbohydrate, you're going to be fat. If you have carbohydrate, you can run better on fat. Um there's a lot of myths like that, but the fact is there's no research supporting that eliminating carbohydrates is going to actually help you in team sports. So we, we do promote a high-carbohydrate diet around games and around heavy training. Um, there's that a lot of research saying that um, or supporting it, especially with 
intense exercise. Um, and you only have to watch something like the Tour de France where the guys are running so much and they're practically eating meals every, you know, 70 or 80 Ks to get them through. So um, mm. I, I say that, well, you know, a lot of people in the world will probably say carbohydrates really bad, but I'm, you know, I think it's, you know, for, for someone who, whether you're an elite athlete or someone performing at, a, you know, a medium medium level, um, whether it's football or other team sports, I think, you know, carbohydrate and the timing of it, um, yeah, is a critical factor. So some yeah. carbs are, uh, sorry, Craig, some carb, go. some carbs are good then, basically. Oh, abs- yeah, absolutely, yeah. Like, you don't want to obviously go out and have pasta every night, but if if you're going to uh, play a game or you're, you're doing a heavy a heavy block of training, you won't be able to train or play at the intensity you want to without carbohydrate. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing which, which people get um, a little bit misunderstood, they don't have carbohydrate. They, let's say if you're playing a game on the weekend and you don't have carbohydrate the whole week, you only have it before the game and that's it, your body's not going to oxidize the carbohydrate as efficient as someone who, let's say, has a little bit of carbohydrate midweek when, let's say, when they have their main training and then some the night before on day of the game. So you, you, your gut needs to adapt to the to the macro, macronutrients. So that's why I think it's important to have it around. You've got to have it at the right times. No point having it if you've got four days off and you're sitting on the couch. But if you are doing some training, you, you need it prior to it. And if you've got a training session directly after it, you'll need carbohydrate in between the sessions. So um, as I said, I'm not saying go out and smash a loaf of bread, but um, mm. but having <laughs> having a small amount at, at those meals does help. 100%. I've deprived myself for so long for no reason, Macca. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the, yeah. some of the diets going around at the moment, such as yeah. paleo and high fat, low carb and, and those sorts of diets. Yeah, absolutely. So when, so when, basically, when I, when I talk, I always think as a at the performance nutritionist, I'm not, I haven't got the hat on as you know the dietitian working in the hospital or a clinic. Yeah. Um, but from my view, um, I can, I'll start talking from an from as you know working with athletes, and then you guys can, um, if you're still interested, we can maybe move on to the general population. But with, yep. So with the paleo diet, I really like the concepts. I think having foods which are natural and unprocessed is really good what i don't agree with is or um, my view is i don't think you need a one starve yourself of so so many good foods such as grains such as some carbohydrate options um and also the the amount of red meat these people eat i just don't think it's logical and they base it on um our ancestors who were you know whatever a million years ago um were stomping around the ground, but back then they probably didn't have any other option. Whatever they found, they just ate. So yep. it's a little bit of a weird, a weird scenario. The concepts are good. You know, a lot of um, a lot of a lot of fruit, a lot of vegetables, um, you know, a lot of protein options. But then saying, you know, I need to have twelve scrambled eggs before a football game. I just, I just don't understand <laughs> that. It just doesn't. Yeah, but yeah, you know, I think for the general person, if you do follow that. Do follow that and modify it to cutting the portions down quite a bit. Um, good on you. I think you're going to see some results. But for an elite athlete who re- is required to run 16, 17, 18 kilometers a game at high intensity, um, that diet does not support that. Yep. Um, and yeah, so that, that's my view from a performance point of view. And 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 you know the the other extreme for a um, for the youth. It, it's also probably not not beneficial as well, um, as in having you know, giving your children that much meat. Or I think there was a recent thing that Pete Evans, the the chef from Master, if he released, he was about to release a baby cookbook, but they found that it was really high in vitamin A, and that's that can be harmful to a baby. And that was just purely because of the types of greens he had in this food. Whereas you know, a lot of um, Australian kids, you know, they would have their one or two wee picks in the morning, and I just don't understand that that's that bad for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it's an interesting one. Um, and then, you know, there's the other extreme the people who want to lose weight. I think it can be really beneficial to limit your processed foods, which do contain a lot of that sugar, and that's how people can lose weight. So, I sort of sit in the middle. I think the ideas behind that type of diet is very good, 
but the extreme people go or the lems people go with it i think uh isn't needed so yeah that's just my view i suppose there's a million people probably argue with me but um yeah i'll like for our guys anyway i think they understand um and tr- you know the good thing for me is they have trust in 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 um the dietary advice I, I put in place so yeah so what about the uh the high fat low carb diet yeah that again so i think if if you're an athlete um you, to have high fat just doesn't make sense they need a little bit of fat a lot of our guys um you, you need to help it's a contact sport you need to have support around your tendons and your ligaments and your bones and all these structures so a little bit of fat generally i promote healthy fat so olive oil olive salmon a lot of the omega threes, almonds, nuts, but um, having abundance of that. Saying you know, we're not having um, any potatoes, but we're having you know a kilo of bacon. Um, I just don't see how that can help our performance at all. Um, there is there is some really good, not research, but practical um, practical knowledge which says that the ordinary person who is overweight can adapt a high fat low carbohydrate diet and and lose quite a bit of weight which i'm saying outstanding but my next question will be if we eliminate some of that fat and focus on um low carbohydrate only will that be will you will that be a lot will you be better off um so yeah i sort of same sort of thing i do see in the middle um for athletes no way i'll never i'll never promote it there's absolutely no research on it for Mm. the general population i think it can be okay what did you do, Macca? What did I do? Yeah, you've what lost you a bit of weight. Well, you've lost a bit of weight. I just cut out the crap that I was eating, basically. Less takeaway, smarter portion sizes. That was it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a simple, it's a simple equation. The reason, um, yeah, the other thing, obviously, if, if when people go on these diets, whether it's a juice diet or a, um, you know, no white food diet or whatever else it is, um, you, you need. It, the way you can't do it for 20 years a lot of people do it for a year maybe six months and then they just go back to their old ways so being someone if if you do do a bit of exercise and you eat the right amount of foods at the right times throughout the week you tend the, the diet tends to last a lot longer so i think you can't on my view is anyway like move again moving away from the athlete population you just can't deprive people of stuff that they enjoy so you need to occasionally give them something which you know they're going to enjoy but then the rest of the six days of the week they're going to be really strict really anal with their training and nutrition habits mm. um so that, that's the other thing with a lot of those diets there's no real long term because they've probably been a big trend the last five or six years there's no real long term 15 20 year studies or 15 20 year case studies that have shown people who have stayed on it and seen good results so um and that's that's the obviously other thing with with something like a paleo when people are consuming that much meat, you know how are they when they're seventy or eighty years old? Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's just an interesting topic. Um, and yeah, as I said, it, it does cause a lot of controversy. People have a million views on it, which is okay. That's fine. With, you know, if we're looking at if if you're just talking about general training, there's a million views on it. But um, mm. yeah, it's just one of those things. And at the same time, you you've also got to work out what works for you. So, yeah. Well, what yeah. did you do, Rick? What did I do? Yeah. Um, I followed the Michael Jordan diet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, no, actually, I made it up. I, um, uh, I read an article on, um, on my, from Michael Jordan's trainer, old trainer, and he obviously must be releasing a book. And uh, he just said if any athlete like basketball came to him about seriously wanting getting fit, he said to them he'd cut out the sugar like all sugars, um, dairy um, and carbs. And um, so it's a bit excessive, but I guess I... So I, I basically have two eggs for... Boiled eggs for breakfast, a tin of tuna with a packet of frozen veggies for lunch, and then I try and have meat and uh, meat and salad or meat and veg for dinner. And I cut out dairy and drink black coffee, water, mm. water or soda water. And uh, it's actually sort of it's worked for me. Um, oh people, yeah, yeah. No, you're. Right. I was just going to say a lot of people think it's boring, but um, I don't mind it. So yeah, uh, well, especially you know, obviously when you when you do make a change and you see results, um, you obviously want to keep continuing continuing with what you're doing. Um, and mm. 
as I said, like if if you're someone who doesn't exercise, um, yeah, that's I think that's really really good. Um, I think the you know cutting out or or having small amount of carbohydrates, um, yeah, you'll definitely hundred percent see results. Um, it's a matter of when you do start doing really intense exercise, whether you need to adjust that a little bit. That's the only probably the only criticism I have of the the whole whole low carb diet. Um, the other one, which yeah, I'll, this the other thing, which would be the um, the the dairy and um, ensuring you are you know getting enough calcium and mm. your bone your bone your bone is staying strong and your bone mineral content still still up. But um, oh, it's funny you say that. I, was, I mean, I've I went extreme probably for three months, and I went from 113 to 96 kilo, and uh, and I've slowly started reintroducing small small components of those aspects. Yeah. Bit of cheese. Uh, yeah. I don't. I don't really have milk. Um, but uh, yeah, so I try to reintroduce a bit of uh, a bit of dairy and. Yeah, uh, well, that, that's good. Yeah, because now that you've got, you've obviously made some really, you know, some pretty strict adjustments, which has worked for you and has helped you, which is excellent. Mm. So now, if, if you do slowly introduce those, you're not going to put on 15 kilos straight away. You you actually probably stabilize it. Or if you do do that and your training goes up, you'll probably actually see further improvement. So that's excellent. That's yeah, really good. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I still work out three, four times a week now to, to accompany that. And it's interesting because the times where I have the heavier meals and I go and I work out on the cross trainer because I've got bad knees, but the times I have the heavier meals, I'm really lethargic with my exercise. But when, I, when I'm when i light, when I don't have much in my stomach, sort of, you know, just the tuna and the, the veggies for lunch before I go train, um, yeah, I seem to exercise uh, a lot more thoroughly. So, yeah. Uh, um, it's it's interesting. It, it obviously plays, and it's I've spoken to a few players over the last couple of years, and it's interesting. They, um, I think you guys say or get them to weigh in every day. Um, my wife has a go at me for weighing in every day, but I try to argue that by weighing in every day, it's keeping me accountable and also tracking what I'm eating or what I'm consuming and how it's affecting my diet. So um, I can see I can see a, a benefit to doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really good to track. Not obviously we track our guys with. I'm a dr- with a lot of different types of measures, but just for the general person, I think um, just yeah, if you if you do keep a track on that, it's 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 not you know it is. Oh, if you don't keep a track of it, it is easy to to lose your way a little bit. So it's uh yeah, it's a good little and obviously you know scales don't cost much, so it's a, it's a good mm. little tool to have set up in your bathroom. I think if that's your aim to lose weight, yeah. Do you see a place for supplements, Andrew? Like, I'm not talking the dank supplements here. I'm not trying to be facetious, but obviously the, you mentioned that you control supplements as well. So um, you think there are healthy supplements that are, are worth uh, taking for players? Yeah, like we, we're always going to promote real foods to because, for example, if I was to go to a gym and have um, a protein shake that has 20 grams of protein, am, am I better off having some uh, natural yogurt with some almonds thrown in it, which has the same amount of protein. They're both way, they're both going to increase our muscle protein turnover. So they do the same job. I'll say always go the real food. In my environment, when, for I'll, I'll use the example of, um, of us on a main training day, the boys will do a session between the f- finishing the session, by the time they go in, they might have a quick meeting, then they might have to do a media commitment. Then they have to do recovery. They'll have a massage. Then they might have lunch two hours after that. I know that I need to get 20 grams of protein into these guys straight after the session. So I will say, all right, guys, protein shake. Let's, you know, I'll, I'll generally have each player as an individual protein shake which they have after any weight session or, or any uh, football or running session. Um, so that's fine. I keep it really basic. It's pretty much um, protein. Um, some guys, if needed, as ordered by the doctor, if they do have a blood test and someone is low in vitamin D or someone is low in iron, then we will prescribe them one of those um, tablets to supplement that. Um, that's generally done straight up, you know, after a blood test and, and the doctor says, yep, the player needs this. Um, apart from that, there might be a couple of players on a creatine, which helps power output. Uh, but from a supplement point of view, that's basically it. We do keep it really basic. I really think a lot of the other stuff can be overkill. Um, and is it going to give you an extra edge over going for the real food option? I'm not I'm not too sure. I don't think so. Mm. Um, the other thing is given 
the, the, the age of our list, I just don't think it's really good to keep promoting that. Um, so we, you know, obviously I'm all for supplements. Um, when I say that, I'm not talking about an injection program. I'm talking about just basic, basic nutrition, which is supported by a lot of evidence. Um, so mm. we follow a lot of the AIS guidelines. There's some really good researchers, um, researchers there and practitioners who've done a lot of study in the area and, um, yeah, so if we are going to give a supplement, it would be basically following their guidelines. Um, so, yeah, I do think it, I do feel there's a place. On the out, that, that's talking from an elite athlete, but if I'm a plumber who finishes work at 3 o'clock, um, I'll go to the gym, do a session, then I've got to go quickly go and give a quote. If I'm not prepared and haven't got a snack in my car, a protein shake might be the option, and that, that's okay. I've got no issue with that. Um, mm. I think when people hear the word supplements i probably think of pills and injections where where that's that's completely on the other side to what we do so what is what is actually a protein shake then yeah so it's generally um a lot of the researchers if you just go into a any sort of scientific journal and type in protein intake after resistance training or after exercise there is a heap of articles which support that 20 gram 20 grams a number so after any session 20 grams of protein is all you need if you have 30 or 40 the effects are going to be same as having 20 grams from a recovery point of view so what that basically does is um, regenerate your muscle your muscle tissue the longer you starve yourself of protein after exercise the more muscle damage is going to occur which means one the recovery process is going to be compromised so you will be sore your next session might not be as intense or that your next game might not be at the standard you want. So we're going to try and do it all. Same reason why we do some ice baths and some other recovery methods. We're going to do all we can to get the players ready for training that week and then the game coming up. Um, so, yeah, so a, a protein take is a pretty, it's a pretty easy um, form of getting that 20 grams in, whether we're doing a running session at, um, in the city at the uni loop or whether we're, we've just finished a gym session. Um, so yeah, we've got, we get all our, um, our supplements through a company called Optimum Nutrition. They're, they're quite a well-known American company. Um, and they branched out to Australia a couple of years ago. Currently they do, um, us, they do Melbourne Heart and they do the Brisbane Broncos. So they try, they've just got one team in each code. Um, and they're worldwide, their, their supplements are probably the best in the world given the, when, when, when I say that the quality is really good, um, what's on the ingredients is what you get. And also, it's all batch tested, so it's all it's all properly tested before our players consume it. Which again, um, make sure that nothing is contaminated. Which uh, which was my follow up question to that: how vigilant you'd have to be in making sure that it uh, doesn't contain anything that it's not supposed to contain. Yeah, exactly right. So that's that's why it is really important. I've even you know five six years ago before this whole Essen stuff came out, um, I was really anal with with the companies that the companies that we promote to our athletes i think that's not just to me that's australia wide mm -hmm. i think it's really important to have a product that doesn't necessarily need to be made in australia but it needs to be properly tested to ensure that it is it is clear of contaminants and um so we're we're really really strict in our players and they only can have products which both myself and the doctor have overlooked um and that's generally for the optimum range um yeah, we might. There might be three or different, three or four different types of powders which they have, um, and that, and yeah, a couple of other a couple of other things. So we, we do keep it really 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 basic, um, but but we, we do the, the small things but really really well. I was just going to say, Andrew, I heard a rumor that um, you bought you purchased some new bliggy shoes. Apparently, uh, you're trying to be Darren Junior. Is that true? I, I I didn't actually. Um, I was due for a new pair of runners, and two of the I won't mention their names, but two of the senior pl players of our list one one being the captain and one being our centre half forward, who were sponsored by Adidas. They actually were nice enough to to get me a couple of pairs. So I was uh, I wasn't going to knock that back, and I thought if um yeah, you know, I said I'm not I'm not I'm not on a I'm not on a million bucks a year, so I can't go out and buy a new pair of runners each week. So I definitely took that on, and I did cop a little bit of crap today from um, 
the coach and a few of the players, but I'm sticking by them. And <laughs> I think I might, might, one of them might be my game day pair that I wear on the bench. <laughs> Well, I mean, they can't give you too much grief because all I see is Mr. Fashion, um, Travis Boak, on Facebook these days. So he's uh, he's got a bit of style about him, that man. Yeah, well, if it's if it's good enough for him, for him, I'm sure it'll be good enough for me to to roll around the new. And I actually, just went on for a run with him, and they're a really good pair. So if, if any of you want a running a, a good running shoe, get the Adidas Ultra Boost. They're, they're an outstanding thing. Well, they're even getting plugs in on this show. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. I got Optimum and Adidas. I love it. <laughs> and I'm actually drive around a Renault if you haven't got one yet. That's Proudly it. brought to you by New Vision. <laughs> uh, well, that's that's it for me. Look, I, yeah. I really appreciate you coming on, and thanks for your time, Andrew. No, no worries at all. Um, Any time, and hopefully you uh, you gain something from it. I know I always talk, Absolutely. especially whether it's from training or whether it is nutrition or whether it's strength. I um, I generally always have the hat on talking about an elite athlete i generally you know probably for the past seven or eight years i haven't actually worked with someone outside of that population but um yeah there's obviously a lot of things we do for our players that can be brought across obviously you don't have to do at the same standard or same level but um yeah hopefully if your audience picked up one or two things yeah no worries at yeah. all absolutely well thanks mate for giving up your time and uh look hopefully we get a chance to speak to you again in the future no, no worries at all. Um, yeah, thank you. Hopefully you enjoy the game on Sunday. Absolutely. Can't, can't wait, mate. Hopefully we get a big win. Yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Thanks, Andrew. Cheers, mate. No worries. No worries. See ya.